Crown Point. Yes, I'm from Crown Point. And uh, as I say, this is a small group, so feel free to talk up. Okay. Uh, the subject is tray blankets. Now, you're seeing tray blankets. Is this what you expected to see? No. What were you expecting to see? Not everything alike. I don't want to see an assortment. <laughs> <laughs> all different designs, you know, like, like in the book there. Yeah, I, I didn't really know what to expect. Okay, well, a lot of people think right away Indian blankets. Yeah. And when they think mm -hmm. Indian blankets, they think of the blankets from the Southwest. Right. Made mm -hmm. by the Indians. Right. right. Well, trade blankets were made by the Europeans awesome. for the Indians mm -hmm. as a trade item. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about two different things. And sometimes mm -hmm. people are a little disappointed, but I. I do appreciate the Indian blankets from the Southwest, but I love the trade blankets, especially mm -hmm. the Hudson Bay. And you see I have, they look a lot, that's because I'm very partial to the Hudson Bay. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, they're, pro they're a product of the trade item, of the trade industry, fur trade industry. The Europeans wanted the furs. Now, do you know why they wanted the furs? They're fashions. Hats. Beaver. Have the hats, yes. the beaver hats. Mm -hmm. It's the beavers that really open it up. The beaver hats are very, very, very much in demand. Mm -hmm. So the Europeans wanted the fur, especially the beavers. Mm -hmm. We're talking about black gold. Mm -hmm. okay. This was their mm -hmm. currency. And of course, the Native Americans wanted the items that the Europeans mm -hmm. could bring over. Items made from metal, mm -hmm. your guns, beads, ribbon. And blankets, blankets mm -hmm. are very important. Mm -hmm. Everyone kind of thinks about the guns, but the blankets, I think, had more coverage than maybe the guns did. But anyway, this is a beaver pelt, and this is what very much was in demand for making the top hats. What they would do, they would remo remove these long guard hairs, mm -hmm. and they get down to this real soft hair. That soft hair, they'd shave off mm -hmm. and mix it to make felt. It was a really fine felt. These soft hairs have barbs that hold. So that's why the beaver fur made nice felt because the barbs would really hold it together. I'm going to pass that around. So that's what they made the hat out of then, the mm -hmm. felt? Mm -hmm. So then the hats are made from the felt. Now, as I say, they remove the guard hairs and then they would shave off those soft outer hairs and they would mix those with mercury. Mm -hmm. That's why they went a little. So, the Mad Hatters. It's based on fact. It is. Mad Hatters. So, it's fact. It's actually fact. It's fact. It's fact. It's fact. It's fact. And luckily, the Europeans oh, discovered it's silk. It's not a good thing. I think that's an interesting fact. It's a fun fact. But anyway. How did you get the guard hairs out of it? That was really a job for the kids. They would have to pull them off. Oh. And then the softer hairs would be shaved off by the adults. And then, luckily, I guess it was the adults that mainly mixed the false hairs with the mercury to get the mad hatters. Mm -hmm. Did they have the kids use the mercury? <laughs> anyway, that's what really opened it up. And that was the currency called the black gold. Mm -hmm. And uh, you see these little marks? Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's a lot of stories about those little marks, too. Uh, actually, it was the French who started the fur trade back in who knows when, back in the early 1600s, but probably even before then. Then Hudson Bay came in in 1670 and kind of got it all, all organized. And these little marks were brought in by, well, they say the French did it too. Mm -hmm. And when the French did it, that was the price tag. Now, according to what I've read, mm -hmm. each little point was worth a beaver pelt. So this blanket would have been cost four beaver pelts. But now Hudson Bay introduced the points in their blankets in 1760, and it was not the price tag. It was the size and the weight. A uh, four point was our equivalent to a double bed. And in today's world, they'll go up to eight points. That would be a king size bed. And that's a big blanket, and is it heavy? Um, this one is Hudson Bay, a point and a half. This is for a little, uh, probably an infant. And the half point I find to be kind of interesting too. I'm gonna put this here. 
Uh, the half point could have been an imperfect pelt, but more than likely it was worth, uh, uh, let's see here, it would have been worth a token, what they call their trading tokens. The Hudson Bay Company developed, developed trading tokens and board nominations for such things so they could vary their size. Um, these are still being found, much to my surprise. They're being found in uh, Lake Michigan from boating accidents. And I have a friend who lives in town, and her family has property up in Wisconsin. And when they were putting in fence, digging the fence posts, they dug up some, oh along with trade silver. So they're still being found. Of course, they're, they're, they go way back to the 1700s. Let's back up a little bit here. Trade items. We talked about some of the trade items. Of course, the metal is very, very important. And the blankets, beads, and ribbons. Mm -hmm. The Native Americans furnished the furs, but they also furnished corn and other things such as that. It really got to be a big industry. And I'm surprised at the value they have trans translated some of to compare to today's costs. And it's way really, really up there, much to my surprise. Um, if you're interested in the manufacture of the hats, mm -hmm. this goes into a little explanation of how the hats are made. Oh, oh, yeah. And you're welcome to look at any of these books. Okay. How are the blankets made? Are they woven? The blankets are woven, yes. And they were woven by hand until the middle of the 1700s. Then they became automated. Mm -hmm. So when the power loom came in? Yes. Right. Uh, but originally they were all woven by hand. Uh, Hudson Bay is an English, England, English company. Uh, the Europeans really had 10 manufacturers, or mm -hmm. I have to be careful how I say that because Hudson Bay was not a manufacturer. Hudson Bay was strictly a trading company. Mm -hmm. The Europeans had 10 such companies. Uh, Canada had seven, and the United States had 10 in the heyday of this industry. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the United States, there's only one left now. That's a Pendleton. Uh, during World War II, their factories were used for war industries, and many of them never came back to, to the blanket industry. And one by one, they're leaving Europe. And I just found out with the sharing, present, sharing deal last summer when I gave a presentation that the Whitney Company is out of business. The Whitney Company furnished many of the blankets for the Hudson Bay Company. Originally, the Hudson Bay Company, as I say, was not a manufacturing company. They were strictly a trading company. And they got many of their blankets from the Whitney, mm -hmm. which was a town, but the whole town had industries for the blankets. Uh, the Hudson Bay Company had high standards. And many of the companies from whom they brought the blankets, such as the Whitney, would meet their standards, but when they would sell their blankets under their own names, they, their standard was not as high. And the Hudson Bay Company has really left their, has maintained their standards. And if you come up feeling that, or I think it's lovely. Now, this is not a new blanket. The only new blanket I got was back in 1957. And since then, I kept them at resale shops. So I don't know how um, much use this has had. I can age it. I can age it by the labels, which is very interesting. You can tell this is my little guide. Uh, all that, there's a, a complete identification by the labels in here for Hudson Bay and some of the other companies. It goes back quite a few years. Uh, and you can determine the age by the label. The, light, the differences in the label are very minute, but you, if you look at it, you can really see. You can see the difference. My, I have some that go back to the 30s. 18 inches? 19, no, 1930. You know, they're so fragile. They don't hold up very long. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a museum in uh, Nebraska that has some real old ones. Boy, they're under glass, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. Uh, I just turned to this page, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, as I said, the Hudson Bay claims that they do not use the points as pricing, strictly size and weight. Uh, the author of this book claims that a lot of people get the feeling 
the Hudson Bay also uses those points as a pricing because by coincidence, and uh, there is a coincidence right here, there's a little chart, chart through the years, and in 2000, uh, the four point Hudson Bay was selling for about $200. And the price in the Beaver was four and a half pals at that time, just by coincidence. And when I got this a couple years ago, I paid $45 for it. So we're just about on the same level there. Mm -hmm. it, it varies. If you're interested to do it, uh, you're welcome to look through the books for some of the, the label differences. Mm -hmm. Now what, what does the label tell you in terms of aging? What do you, what do you look for? Very subtle differences. Sometimes in terms just, of the design or the seal? or Some of the information that it gives. Okay. It's very, very subtle. There's no dates on the labels. No dates on the no. labels. So but you'd have to know certain time periods had a certain design. You can pair it to the labels in the book. It really helps. It really gotcha. helps. Uh, Hudson Bay's are, well, I guess all the trade blankets are collectible. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fun to go around and see what I can get in the resale shops. They come in all colors. I have a red one, but it's a eight point, and it is really big and heavy to haul around. You don't think about blankets being heavy, do you? But when you get a couple of them together that size, they are heavy. Um, according to this book, too, it goes into some of the commemorative blankets that they had produced. There's even a purple that was in honor of the Queen of England. What are they made out of? Wool. 100% wool, as far as the European ones are. Well, no, I'm not finding just because I want the purple. Oh, there it is. Maybe there's a point in the bird. I don't think it's very pretty, but. Oh, uh huh. The blankets. Yeah. Boring. It's a boring one. Here, if you look real careful, you can see some of the differences in the labels. Very, very soft. Very, very soft. Very soft. Do you have any? Uh, do you have any of them? Do you have any of these? No, I have wool blankets. I have some old wool blankets. Old wool, but not from the Something trading Something from the St. Mary's Company. My mother always used to talk about it as being a special blanket, but I don't know why. Well, I, I should look it up. That could be it's one of the ten that was produced yeah. in America. Um, <laughs> okay, you're talking about what they are made. The European ones were all made of wool. Mm -hmm. And uh, those that are made in the United States, especially the Pendleton, mm -hmm. were made of a combination. 88% wool and 12% cotton. Mm -hmm. uh, you've all heard the name Pendleton, have you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Out in Oregon? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Pendleton was one of the first American companies that got in on this trade mm -hmm. blanket story. Uh, that They came in in the late 1800s and by uh, the Bishop family, and they were smart. They were really, really smart. They designed their blankets to please the Native Americans as far as the designs were concerned. So they have some very colorful ones, very pretty ones, and they have been very important to the Native Americans up until today. They're still used as gifts. Well, you know, they have those powwows, Indian powwows, I've read that they they give them away as gifts. Yes. yes. Not only at the powwows, but they're used between themselves, they're given as gifts. Yes. This is, uh, are, any, are you people aware of Shibuli? Yes. The glass blower? Mm -hmm. He's really world, world renowned. Very world renowned. Mm -hmm. And um, some of his first pieces were, his first pieces of glass were designed after Pendleton blankets. He has a fabulous collection of Pendleton blankets. This whole book deals with his collection of Pendleton blankets and some of the pieces that he blew mm -hmm. from the blankets. There's a glass, there's the blanket. Mm -hmm. There's a glass, there's a blanket. Whoa. Yes, it's really, really something. Uh, and the Pendleton blankets, who was looking? You were looking at this earlier, yeah. weren't you? All its designs. Um, so the Bishop family was very, very smart. Um, and they're the only ones, they are the only U.S. producers who are still producing them. Uh, are they the family that started Pendleton? Or? Vicious, yes. Vicious As you know, the uh, Pendletons Laura. sell more than trade or blankets. Oh, yeah. They're wool fabric. Sweaters and wool. Yes. Yes. It never wears out. Skirts. 
Oh yeah. <laughs> you get one use. Okay. You get it all your life. <laughs> kids. Yeah. I do have notes, but I get talking. Okay. Why? Give a little bit of thought as to why Northwest Indiana played such a big role in the fur trade. The Great Lakes. Well, for traveling to Marsh. marsh. You came to see Marsh, abundant in wildlife, yes. and that's what's right. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. But mainly the marsh. Mm -hmm. The marsh here, there's a smaller marsh closer to the lake that were very productive in wildlife, mm -hmm. so there are your furs. Mm -hmm. So Northwest Indiana really played a big role mm -hmm. in the fur trade. And there are Few years there have been several fur trade posts. John, the one was at the Collier Lodge site, wasn't it? Pardon? Wasn't there a trading post at the Collier Lodge site many, many years ago? I believe so, but I couldn't name offhand. Well, that's what I thought, but oftentimes I get these things in my mind and then when I want to go back and document them, I can't find the documentation. So then I wonder. But this will give you some idea of the trading posts in the Great Lakes area. The North is the Hudson Bay Company. Uh, the light blue down by us is the American Fur Company by Astor. And then the other one is the, the darker one is the Northwest. But there are really quite a few. I know there were several on the Kankakee River. And I'm pretty sure I read there was one originally. I'll check our resource material. Oh, okay. Well, it'd be logical too because that was the. I think we're there. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I can't find the documentation where I got that. And I uh, then Joseph Bailey mm -hmm. had one up there. Right. So the Northwest Indiana is very, very rich. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, we do. Food for thought. It's self-explanatory, the changes that came about because of the fur trade. The introduction of metal, for one thing. Uh, just changed a whole lifestyle for the Native Americans. In many ways, very, very good. In many ways, not so very good. Something to think about. Something to think about. But it did just create a whole new lifestyle for them. Um, they didn't trade um, liquor. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. To me, that would be one of the more undesirable ones. Yeah. But I'm trying to think. I'm trying to focus mostly on the desirable. Uh, change their clothing. Very, very much to change their clothing. Uh, let's face it. Prior to the trade period, all their clothing was made out of hides. So they would have to take a hide, remove all the hair, mm -hmm. remove all the fat, and that's very labor intensified, mm -hmm. and then tan it. Well, to, have, to, give, to, to treat a hide for trade, all they would have to do is really just take off the fat layer and just tan it very, very crudely. Very, very, very crudely. So it's a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And besides that, the cloth that they would get, including blankets, were more, they had more versatility, they were more comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, there's many advantages to it, mm -hmm. so uh, many changes came about. And the trade blankets played a big role in that. First of all, the trade blankets were easily used for bedding. They were originally woven two together in such fashion. So it'd be very easy to take one and toss the other one over and then roll up in it mm -hmm. to make like a bedroll. Mm -hmm. um, and they were used to line the wigwams to give extra insulation. Well, if, any, if they had a need that the blanket would fulfill, they would do it here as a picture where they used, made a sail out of the blanket. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, this is a picture taken from the Beaver publication, which was Hudson Bay's original publication. And I have some old ones there that I was able to pick up. The, that magazine is now a Canadian history publication. I don't have any current ones, mm -hmm. but um, 
the opens are kind of interesting. You're welcome to look at them afterwards. Mm -hmm. Clothing. We talked about trading for cotton, wool, but the blankets. The blankets were made into bedding, mm -hmm. as I say, to uh, perhaps insulate their wigwam and sails. Made into clothing, too. Mm -hmm. One of the... Um, the predominantly use, predominantly use of blankets is to wrap around you. I've got to read this to you so I'm not getting messed up. When a blanket is wrapped around the shoulders with the two sides joined in front, the design comes together and completes itself. Joining both sides of the blanket also completes a circle. In a metaphoric sense, the wearer is placed at the center of the universe and becomes a circle. It's both mystical and practical. Mm -hmm. How about coming up at the end? Helping with the style show. Okay. Both of you. I can use both of you. <laughs> no. But let's wrap it around you. That puts you in the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really, it's quite one well, yes, that's right there. Yes, and you have seen that many times. So they also have a language. You're welcome to take them. I think this is bad. This is kind of thing. Think about the language with the blanket wrapped around. You guys see this too. The language. All kinds of moods can be expressed. Oh. Okay. Oh, the anger is really good. Yes. Ah, Did you see the anger one? Yeah, that's really good. <laughs> Now, obviously, would you like to this gets in your way if you want to do any type of work. So there's another way to wear the blankets. And this is, uh, I think when they did it, they had to have several people put together. <laughs> and you're all ready, aren't you? Okay, the bright color on. Wrap it around her. Yeah, this takes a little bit more effort to put her on. Where it is, but you're going to be able to see the damage. Yes, please. Okay. Now, do I have it secure? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if you want to do something, yeah, it needs to be better balanced for you because of your height. Now, if you want to do something, your hands are free, and you have to. You can just push this back. You don't have to worry about the blanket getting in the fire. And if you get cold. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, okay. Now that was usually worn by the women. She looks angry now. But a man, she could be yeah. in a Christmas party. Yeah, right. That's the anger pose. <laughs> <laughs> that used to be worn by the woman, but of course, if a man had chores or something he wanted to do, that was the same mm -hmm. way of doing it. Oh, that's very interesting. Well, now, the capote. Nice. Let's see. This one's made for me. Can I use you? Mm -hmm. I've tried to put this on some men, not thinking you know, that they don't all fit. Oops. <laughs> the body is not flexible as it used there to you be. Go. Did you make this? Yes. This is oh, it has the blanket wonderful. stitch on there too? Yes. yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. We'll roll this up a little bit. Yes. What's nice about it is different sized women can wear it. Yeah. It, it, it's, <laughs> Yes, uh, a large man can't fit into it, yes. so, but they're. Oh, this is amazing. But that also has various styles of expression. Oh, that cute? Here are different yeah, fashions for that. And the color would depict where you're from. Okay. I have all this, uh, the white, but they have a red and green and blue, and that depicts what area you're from. And it's all nice and warm, too. Oh, that's, that's all wool, it's warm. And being all wool, it has. Um, Water repellency. Mm -hmm. So, it's the oil, the lanolin, and the wool. Mm -hmm. Do you think? Do you think well, when I'm out in the rain, I find out the garment, the coat, holds some of the water, but it doesn't go to my body. Okay. So maybe that's the lanolin. I don't know. You know, when you see those Indians out in the Southwest, they wear the blankets around them too. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you said the different colors indicate different areas. Yes. Like geographic areas. Yes. Mainly up north, Montreal, Quebec, oh. in those areas. And who decided? Somebody just randomly assigned colors and said, "Well, 
red is from Montreal or I don't white know is from... That's a good question. Mm -hmm. you know, I never thought did, about that. Did the colors symbolize anything as to why they picked the color for a region? Well, the colors symbolize direction, but most of those are from the north. So I don't think direction right. would be involved that much. Yeah. Now, I just cut something out of the paper the other day about the dress that Islamic women wear, mm -hmm. the dresses, and the chador, they put it over their heads, mm -hmm. and then they have to bite it to keep it closed. And I have to have to bite carry it? it? Yes, they have to hold that into their, into their mouths, and they bite it, and that's how they hold it together. Keep them thought, These Indians, I wouldn't be surprised. Keep, keep it from falling off. To keep it from falling yes, off. But keep it away. Yes. I had nothing to do with it. So they can't talk to anybody else. I had nothing to do with it. This is wrong. That's right. They're a bit That's why. That's why those stances with the blankets. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Are you ready to break the wool? Okay. I wanted to ask you. This is so much flatter. Sarah thought it was warm, but I think it's made this way. No, it was meant rosier. It would have been more. fluffy like that? Yeah, it would have been fluffy. It so nice and evenly. Whitney White made England all wool. Cool. And it would have been um, much, much bigger. Cold like, 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 uh, like, yes, but yeah. keep in mind that's the Hudson Bay. Yeah. The Hudson Bay is made to a higher quality. Mm -hmm. And they would maintain their blankets too by rushing. Oh, 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 Okay, she's had her eye on yeah. that <laughs> cotton. <laughs> Make, so, it, make an offer. Uh, oh, put it on. 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 Put it It's perfect. Okay, that was made from what they call a camp blanket. Yeah, it's and it's the U.S. that got into that. Okay. okay, your eyes lit up when I said yeah. camp blanket. You're aware of them. Yeah. I've heard of them, yes. Aren't they like a heavy cotton? Heavy cotton. Yes. yes. And it's they so uh, came in about the 1920s, oh. more or less for the parents to buy for the children to take to camp. Yes. Hmm. Uh, I don't know, can you still show us a weave? It's a, the Beacon Company that was instrumental in that, and mm -hmm. I don't have any labels, so oh. I don't know if that's a Beacon or it's not rich enough. That's how used to sell all these. They do. Do they still sell? Yeah, they still sell. Oh, okay. okay. so much uh, I haven't seen them in a long time. I wonder if they still sell them in the sweaters and stuff. They probably it sold like they sold it a lot more because Whitney Point shot our production in 2002. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The rich are colors, whereas I was part of the trade. Exactly. The so it was like these plants in South Carolina. Oh, and cut and then cut. Oh, that's smart. The yeah. same way that they're doing the blankets now that retire. And then these and are the same. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, because they couldn't get a good a good right, dye. Right, they couldn't get it there. And they got and they and, they, and it was a major crop in South Carolina. It looks like they put slave stations. Yeah, so it's true. The reason they make sure they did the ground was grown in the islands of the Caribbean. But they so, said, I'm sorry, but they do this more. Well, yes, yeah. yeah. the slaves do this because the smell is too They're missing all that, which I think is very important. Just yeah. part of a he puts the professor's hat on. <laughs> oh, uh, the, no, no. I, I don't know the details. Right. Right. All I know is that the indigo dye right. was very precious for them. It was very hard to get. It was hard. Yeah. It was a major crop. Okay, so I'm marking this. Reversible. So nice. Thank you. As they say, the stars are you. You won't have any blankets left in your house, which <laughs> <laughs> you better count these when you leave. Well, they do take a lot. I'll tell you. We need a pattern. We need yes, a pattern. Right. You didn't hear what he was saying about that. I got it. Don't tell him about indigo. <laughs> well, in South Carolina in the 1700s, a major crop that they grew was indigo. It's a plant. And the plant was shipped to England 
because that was a major trading partner mm -hmm. for South Carolina because the plant produced mostly blue, but a dye. It's that hard was to get a good blue dye. It was hard dye. to get yeah. a good blue dye. And so the crop was very important and it became and a cash crop. in England? Not very well. If the climate wasn't conducive enough because it had to be grown in like a warm, warm climate. So they grew a lot of indigo plants and a lot of rice mm -hmm. South Carolina and they shipped it to England and of course the Hudson Bay Company was a British company mm -hmm. and they used the dyes well, so. not all for these because that's why I asked about the colors because the indigo is mostly blue mm -hmm. and I see some, some of the dark blue that's in here mm -hmm. uh, but it's one of the reasons they had a lot of slaves in South Carolina because they had more slaves there than any other state because they, the plant was had such a stench to it when they grew it, they were saying at that time, well, this is something that only the slaves can work on. We can't have, you know, white people working on it. That's the slaves. And they started to grow the crop and it originally been grown in the Caribbean in one of the islands. And then they brought the crop to South Carolina and grew it. It worked well. It was a big trading item with England. So they brought a lot of slaves in to work the rice and the indigo fields. Was the indigo plant uh, useful for anything else besides the dye? No, it really didn't. It wasn't a very good plant for eating. I mean, you could, it was edible, but it really wasn't that good. It was mostly for the dye benefit for the clothing industry. And it's interesting because when they did this in South Carolina, like 1700 to 1800, that's just about the time this Hudson Bay Company started. Mm -hmm. Like in the middle of the 1870s. 1670 is when it first introduces blankets. Right. And uh, they start in South Carolina, early 1700, shipping the indigo dye. And the original blankets were usually all white, yeah. such as this one, maybe a black or maybe a red stripe. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of the dye situation, and I did not fully understand that whole situation with the indigo dye. Thank you so yeah. much for sharing that. See what I mean? Yeah. This can be a learning process. Where do the other dyes come from? Do you have any idea? Well. Originally, they used natural dyes. Mm -hmm. After that, I don't know. I have a hard time. Natural dyes from plants. From plants, from plants, plants, from plants. organic, regrown things. <laughs> then later, when chemicals came in, much later, then of course it was synthetic. You know, the so dyes. And I have a hard time when I use natural dyes getting them set. Yes. Well, and like I think onions, 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 onions skins, skins, don't they make a, a yellow color? The 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 but the, chem, the commercial ones yes. then if that eliminated that problem of getting it set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they, didn't, they weren't doing that back in 1670 no. or 1750, the commercial. That's why they did allow the white too. It was easier for them. Right. Because uh, I thought maybe the colors represented something to do with the country of origin of the trading company. No, uh, from what I've read, it's all the areas of the Quebec areas. and Montreal, right. and most of, most, most of them, the Great Lakes came down from that area. Right. Right. Although um, the trading took place, the fur trade took place all over the United States, which surprised me. I didn't realize that because I don't think of the beaver as being a southern animal. No, mostly. Uh, Upper Midwest and That's Canada. what I thought. The beaver, of course, they weren't all the furs, but the beaver was the prime one. It was the one. Okay, I gotta check my notes to be sure I'm covering everything. And I, I really appreciate your participation. Okay. Um, we're talking about the use of the blankets. We talked about the language, using its gifts and the styles. And what has interested me within recent years, the recycling. The Native Americans never wasted a thing and they recycled their blankets. And it does, it took several of us a little while to figure out how they did it. I have a good friend who is a program uh, planner for the Lake County Parks, and she helped me on this. Uh, we had the first step all figured out. Naturally, they would unravel the blankets, mm -hmm. such as this. And then take these threads, And re spin them. Okay. Oh my goodness. Uh -huh. Hey, it works. It really works. I don't have any. Maybe if I get some longer ones here. Um, you get several together. And you re spin it on your leg. Have you ever seen them make cordage? Yes, yes. It's the same process. They have that leather or that piece on their leg so they don't rub it raw. 
there's something, one of the... the with the cords, you have to have your leg protected. Yes. Uh, with this, we don't have to have the leg protected, and the bare skin does work better than on fabrics. Uh -huh. must, the oil must kind of attract. Oh, okay, so. so you can re-spin mm -hmm. it. And all those little short pieces? Yep. They were hard workers, weren't they? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I had a ball of working. the respun yarn, but now I'm not finding it. But anyway, it works beautifully. So then what do you do with the yarn? What are some of the things you could do with the yarn? Well, you're familiar with finger weaving, are you not? Okay, for making the sashes. Uh, they could use some of that respun yarn for the finger weaving. And this is Judy's forte. Yeah. Judy judges making bags. <laughs> they do something making bags. Mm -hmm. They just never wasted a thing. Now, this is my product. <coughs> I'm not using respun blankets. I go buy my yarn. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, is Judy making them with the. Juice? No, she's making them with hemp twine. Mm -hmm. Or at least the, what I've seen her make. Mm -hmm. Well, a utility bag. Mm -hmm. uh, they can make a real nice. Is it like crocheted or what? Pardon? Uh, How's that made? Crocheted? No, it's a twining method. You use two threads and you go in and out, in and out, in and out. Hmm. It's a twining method. Um, I'm talking about weaving, like weaving. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talking about the twining, the European blankets are all twined. The, um, the U.S. blankets are used in the regular what I call basket weave. And here's an explanation of the different weaves. You have your twine and then the more woven. Hmm. Okay, back to my notes. We're talking about the Whitney. There was a Whitney that produced many of the blankets that the Hudson Bay would sell. Up until the 1920s, they had legal problems. So that took care of that. Uh, and uh, Whitney is now out of business. They disbanded <coughs> in 2002. So the Hudson Bay Company is buying the blankets from an Atkinson company in England, but still English made. And we talked about uh, the Pendleton blankets. I don't have a Pendleton blanket, and I never really was very interested in them. I don't know why. They look, I, so they look southwest, even though that's the northwest. They look southwestern. <coughs> the design. Yeah, the design, yes. Yeah. Uh, in our area, we have the Woodland Indians, so we yes. have a more floral design. Yes. The uh, Pendletons are more geometric, mm -hmm. yeah. which is the Plains Indians, etc. I do not have a Pendleton black, and I've never really been that interested in one. For some reason, as I say, the Hudson Bay has my, mm -hmm. my attention. But if there is one I would like to have, it's this one. This is the one that is commemorative to the Miami. It has your sandhill cranes and the Miami ribbon work that I think is so very, very lovely. And it was designed by a young man who taught me ribbon work, Scott Shoemaker. So I really appreciate that. Do you know Scott? You, you kind of went up. Oh. Uh, I just make it the name. Pardon? Just the, the name. Well, he's of uh, Miami heritage and uh, royalty in the Miami. A, really a nice, fine young man. Now he's a landscape architect, but he still keeps his up with his Native American. Uh, they have him out at the Lakeshore for some of their training sessions, and he does quite a bit for idle jerk. Anyway, he designed this, and because of that, I really like one. But I can't get one now. When they first came out, I didn't have the 200 and some dollars to buy it. And now they're not available anymore. So I guess I'll never have a Pendleton. Okay. You have to see this. Your trade blankets at I get them out of resale shops. Resale shops. Yes. As I say, the first one I bought was in uh, 1957, and that's up in Canada. Um, you can still, there are lots of stores, Hudson Bay stores in Canada. And I'm told there's some in Michigan, Wisconsin, too. And do those, do the proprietors of those stores know that they are trade blankets? Do they identify them as Oh, I'm sure they do. I'm sure they know about them. I, I feel very confident they didn't know about them. Um, I have some older Pendleton catalogs if you're interested. There again, uh, the price of a Pendleton is around 200 some dollars, and the price of a Hudson Bay is recently it's a little bit more than that. Uh, they do keep their value. 
Any other comments? Yeah, this USA one, the Alaskan. What what's the background on that company? Well, I don't know. Is, is, uh, it, is that the, a family name or is that? I don't know. It came into competition with the trade area, and uh, the quality is the same as you can see. It's not the twill; it's the woven. And this is all wool, but most of the U.S. manufacturers have 88 percent wool and 12 percent cotton in theirs. They were, the U.S. manufacturers were to keep the standards of the European, as far as I know yes. and I can determine. Now, do they use wool from the U.S.? I would assume so, but... Because they're mostly out in the... Where are they out in the West? The Southwest, Southwest, but... You mean, well, the Navajos, when the Spanish came to this country, and they introduced no, the about sheep... The, the Spaniards that came in here? The Spaniards came to the Southwest, and then they... Right, but... In terms of current uh, wool. Oh, Nevada, then? I don't know well, what state produces the most wool. I mean, every state has sheep. But transportation is so, yeah, makes it so yeah. accessible now that it wasn't the problem that it was the first. Right. Uh, I thought Australia was known. Australia oh, yeah. is known too, and yeah. England, New Zealand. Ireland, all those countries. And Germany exports quite a few. Um, like I was so surprised to all of a sudden see sheets made in Germany, flannel sheets. The last 10 or 15 years, lots of companies are selling German-made sheets. But I was never aware of that before, what they did there. No, I've never really paid that much attention to it. You have too much to do with it. Well, I do have a love yes, affair with do. the House of yes. and I'm, uh, I, there for a while, I was getting about yeah. one a year. Mm -hmm. I'm not even getting that mm -hmm. now. Uh, and I have the various sizes. I have the eight point, and that's mm -hmm. in a solid red. And it's a nice, it's a nice quality. Mm -hmm. But boy, is it heavy! It is really heavy to haul around. I put these in this tub, these tubs, mm -hmm. and they weigh a lot. The neat thing about the Pendleton is that they developed the jacket loom, mm -hmm. so they could get a d different design on each yes. side of the blanket, yes. and that was a feature for them. Oh, that's okay. reverse, reverse. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's some in there, Laura. Yeah. The pictures of the front and back. Well, I think I've pretty much covered what I wanted to share with you. Do you have any more comments? I think you said um, the one symbol that I was shocked at in there that it had a lot of meaning. The swastika. The what? The swastika. Yeah, we saw in the town. Wait, I'm not following you. The swastika. When I said I was oh, surprised. Oh, the design. You said it had a lot of meaning. Well, I don't. I haven't gotten into the symbolism of that, but that was a very important symbol for them in the early Native American culture. And I think also in the Middle East they used it too. It didn't just mean Nazis. It's early, early. If you get, especially in the Southwest, Southwest, if you get some of their early paintings, you'll see that design yeah. in it. Ooh, I don't know what it means either for them, but. Uh, well, anyway, when you hold a trade blanket in your hand, you're holding a little bit of history and the continuation of their culture because it's still very, well, I shouldn't say very much alive. It's alive today, but not like it was. Uh, and as you say, it's very obvious. Uh, how long is it? Yes. Uh, and so many people will tell you uh, they're part Indian, they're part Cherokee, they're part of this. And, and I think most Americans are proud to be part Indian. I would like to think so. I really do think so, because I mean, my students used to say, oh, this is for you know, my grandparents are Cherokees, and you know, and this and one little boy once said, we're hillbillies. Oh, <laughs> we're hillbillies. My family, we're hillbillies. What, what, just what the, Native American are you? Know, know. They're so uh, innocent. But, uh, you know, but you got to keep in mind, too, though, that uh, because of the, the, oh, yeah. the school and course upon the Native Americans, many of them are afraid to, to admit, and admit their culture. Such a cruel cruel, the re lo relocation of the Indians, uh -huh. that was terrible, and then forcing them to go to boarding schools. The Indians in our area, the Native Americans yes. in our area, were forced out in the 1830s, yes. and it was really very, very sad. You know, this is another thing, too. Um, I do volunteer work at the um, Lakeshore, and we just had a, a Native American workshop at the mm -hmm. Lakeshore I think you really would have liked, mm -hmm. and they emphasize a little bit about the treatment, that the, yes. especially uh -huh. through the schools. Yeah. Right.